beauty of our great outdoors across the USA. Hi there, come on in. You folks around the country haven't been in on the tradition that we've established uh, on our Michigan show for many years of catfish fishing. Now, Michigan has some good places to fish catfish, and we just brought you a story a month or so ago on that. But most of our trips have not panned out, and the trip I promoted for today's show didn't pan out. The big ones just weren't there. So we're going to drift back to, I believe it was 1985, when we had a trip, oh, full of bugs, full of, <laughs> but it was full of fun. So join me. I'm Fred Trost. It's time for the Outdoor Digest. going after catfish on the Grand River with Dean Collins of Lowell. He doesn't like that camera light in his eyes, though. And I can't see where I'm at. Well, how can you tell anyway where we're at when we're in the dark? <laughs> I can, I can, really? I can see. I know the river well enough to where I'm at. Is, is the river high or low or just right? It's uh, fairly high now. You know, if these were mosquitoes, we'd be in deep trouble. You bet. <laughs> How deep is this water on the average? Uh, it runs from 18 inches to over the fishing's about 19 feet. Now, is that where the catfish are in the deep holes? That's where I usually catch them, yeah. This is, this is just a railroad bridge, huh? Yeah, this one is. The next one's a car bridge. Do you have any trains coming by tonight? Not that I know of. See it all. It's late June, still a bit early for a lot of the catfish to bite. A month from now, bridges like this would probably have fishermen dropping their lines all along its width. Deadfalls, snags, and drop-offs along the banks are the marks of some good catfishing holes. That isn't a particularly grappling type of anchor here. Okay. How deep do you suppose it is here, Dean? 19 feet. And that's where the catfish. Okay, we hit. We've hit it now. Let a, lot of a lot out. Good toss. Should I tighten it up here, Dean? Uh, no, I think maybe you might have some more out here. What's some more? Yeah. Now, where where are we anchored over? I mean, why are we right here, wherever we are? A lot of snags, high bank bank with holes in it. Are we directly over the area, or are we at the 19 foot of water all the way through here? Oh, OK. Bob Garner fishing upstream 50 yards with Terry Gerink, all of us using the same types of rigs. A slip sinker. And this isn't very heavy, either. No, there's not too much or so. Here. OK, with two treble hooks rigged up about six, eight inches apart. Now, how do you, how do you hook the one minnow on these two treble hooks? One in the Show head me how you do that. One in the tail. Oh, so it's a long enough minnow that it's gonna. Okay, right up in the upper lip with one of the trebles and the other in the tail. So you're gonna let the when the, when the channel cat picks that up or flathead, you're gonna let it run, and that slip sinker will stay on the bottom. Okay, now that slip sinker is going to be enough to hold that little chub down there? Yeah, he'll work around a little bit. Okay. You cast it out or just drop it right over the side? No, I'll cast very far because you're getting too many snags. But... Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the other rig that we have here, is this for a... Oh, this is for crawdad. You already put one out on the floor for me. Right? I think they're crawling all over the place. Okay, we must have spilled some crawdads here. Here he is. Now, how do you recommend hooking it? Why don't you hook, since you're the you're the guide, you're the expert. I don't want to use the wrong hooking style for this river. You ever boiled crawdads? Not this size. Bigger ones? They have bigger ones, tails, yeah. Yeah, they're dandy. They're like lobsters. OK, there it is. There's the, that's the true turn hook. It has a little kink in it there, and it's especially designed for the crawdads. Let's see if that has a much of a pinch. He's lost a lot of his pinch here, Dean. Make it come. OK, and this is just attached to a, a straight core, rubber core lock sinker that's about a foot and a half up from the 
from the crawdad. We're going to take that over, and there we go. Boy, we got a bad smell here from the bugs on the camera light. Woo! That's something else. Now, what else do we have? You have a crawdad rig? And I just had one for, for a night crawler. Night crawler? Where is in that? We wanted some action. Uh, well, and Kate, we better we better pull all stops here, <laughs> don't you think? Why not? And this is rigged. Is it, is a night crawler rigged up the same way? Yes. Just for the yeah, just a little smaller hook. So. Now, give me the lowdown on these Grand River catfish. How are they going to hit? Well, sometimes if it's a mud cat, you may not even know it's on. If he's, he may, he may just pick it up and it's set there. A little tap, tap, tap. Maybe. Yep. Maybe you'll pick it up and drop back 10 feet. You know, this is, this, is, this is some of the more difficult conditions we've had, OJ, to film something. Yeah, for sure. Um, um, I, it's nice that they aren't mosquitoes. Have you, have you been bitten yet, OJ? No. No, I haven't been bitten yet. They're crawling all over me. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, literally. In my mouth. Why, <laughs> what? Let's close. Turn that camera yeah, off. Thing. Turn that thing off. Jeez. This is something that's, oh, blah. Don't dare breathe in. Mm, breathe in real slow. When we turned the camera light off, the bugs left us alone so we could use our flashlights and hook on some worms. So that's a, the tradition, is that one crawler or two? Just one. Okay, the same rig with the slip sinker. Now you think, well, you said action. We're going to catch more within the crawler? Wow. <laughs> You catch some small ones, maybe, or a sucker, or a carp, or breaks up the night. Okay, well, that's okay. And after a couple of hours, Don and Tom, some local anglers, had one on. What is it? Like a sucker. <laughs> Giving you a pretty good battle. Huh. Well, that's something. That big carp broke up the night all right, and it wasn't the only one that hit. Bob Garner was doing battle, and I mean battle, with what he hoped was a 20-pound flathead catfish. Turned out to be another carp, about 15 pounds. So here we were, spending the midnight shift, trying to make up for last year when we only caught one catfish on our late August expedition, and we got the uncomfortable feeling that this time we were too early. As far as catfish went, we almost came up empty-handed. But fortunately, as in the Michigan Outdoors tradition, we pull it out of the bag with... What do we have? We have a channel cat. Now, it wasn't caught tonight, though. This is one that you call when? About a week ago. <laughs> well, let's take a look at it and see what we were after. This is it, channel cat. That's about the size of the one that we... Maybe it's a little bigger than the one that we got <laughs> last year. Oh, well, fork tail. Here, tip it up. Tip, yeah, tip it up this way. The spines that catfish are noted for are those jobs right there. Shouldn't really play with them like this, should I? Ah, he's not going to do anything. Those spines right there and then the spine on the top. Right? Listen to him. Go ahead. You're on television. That channel catfish was evidently trying to tell us something. I think he wanted to say that we're too early. But thanks to our hosts, Dean Collins and Terry Gerink, we had a good time. And we'll be back this summer. And we promise some catfishing action. I know there are people around the country who catch much bigger catfish than we caught. If you catch a trophy-sized fish, look in our Outdoor Digest magazine, see if you meet the criteria for the minimum weight or minimum length, send it in. That's how you have a chance of appearing in our trophy book. Bill Retluski has himself quite a bowfin or dogfish who weighs 7 pounds 14 ounces. Here's a tiger muskie, 45 inches long, Ed Deemer caught it on a deep diving bomber. Justin Pogue caught this 10-pound, 5-ounce walleye on a little Cleo. 
And here's Matt Keel, a youngster with a large, large mouth bass, six and three quarter pounds, caught it on a spinnerbait. Roger Fletcher's bow and arrow buck had 10 points and a 19 and a quarter inch spread. And that's John Pino with a 10 pointer that had a 14 inch spread. Glenn Pankey called in this 21 pound gobbler with a nine and a half inch beard. Now, Sid Tomaszewicz was hunting on opening day, just looking for venison, and boy, did he get it. Not what he expected. Two does come out. I was going to take the lead doe because I had a permit. The scope was fogged, so I just went down to reach down and get a piece of paper towel. And the lead doe gave a snort, and out he came. I said, well, I got no time to unfog the scope now. Thank goodness for the Marine Corps, which I served in, in Vietnam. Taught me how to shoot. Just put him, centered him up, and did him in. Good shooting, great shooting, as a matter of fact. Just remember to check out that scope before you go again next time, Sid Tomaszewicz. And maybe, just maybe, you'll be our Outdoor Digest Trophy Deer Hunter of the Week again next year. Thanks to support from Florida Anglers, the Florida Legislature has instituted a saltwater fishing license. Residents will pay $12 a year. Non-residents will be charged $30 a year or $15 for a 10-day license. Ted Forsgren of the Florida Conservation Association says the added revenue will yield tremendous benefits to the fishery and to Florida citizens. Saskatchewan has dropped back its limits on sharptail grouse in some areas. Now, continuing drought has cut the limit to three per day. Good news is that rough grouse are at the peak of their cycle in Saskatchewan. Limit on roughs is 10 per day. Ray Scott, founder of the Bass Angler Sportsman Society, has been named the 1989 Fisherman of the Year by the Sport Fishing Institute. The Institute honored Scott for his work on increasing federal aid to restore sport fishing. A Manitoba study shows that by removing predation of canvasback ducks by raccoons, canvasbacks can reproduce in large numbers. In one area, the numbers were twice as high as ever before recorded. West Virginia has opened 19 counties to non-residents to hunt antlerless deer. Non-residents must apply for the antlerless permits. And a Wisconsin biologist has blasted a National Wildlife Federation report on toxics in Lake Michigan fish. Jim Moore, a supervisor in the Wisconsin DNR, says the fish are not nearly as polluted as the Federation reported. It's no secret that waterfall numbers are, for the most part, the lowest they've been in years. And the reasons for the decline are complex. The drought, predators, illegal shooting, and wetland destruction have all taken their toll. And not only on the ducks, but the duck hunters as well. Now, it may look like the time is right to sell the boat and cash out the decoys and take up clay target shooting, but let me urge duck hunters to stay with it. Seasons and bag limits have been reduced, but there are still surplus ducks that can be harvested with no cause for a hunter to feel guilty. Even the North American Wildlife Foundation is calling for duck hunters to continue hunting while asking for voluntary restraint, stopping short of a limit, and or shooting drakes only. But the bottom line is this, the ducks need our help through restraint, duck stamp revenues, and contributions to groups like Ducks Unlimited. The future for waterfowl looks pretty good. But without hunting and the revenues it generates, the waterfall situation throughout North America is doggone bleak. The Spaniel family is made up of more dog breeds than any other. Now, all Spaniels hunt the same way, except the Brittany. How does the Brittany differ? Most Spaniels locate game by scent, then rush in to flush it. Only the Brittany Spaniel holds on point.
There's a new tape available produced by the National Wild Turkey Federation called Passages. Passages is the complete story of the wild turkey, its abundance when the first settlers came to the United States, to its disappearance due mostly to habitat loss. It's a story with a happy ending, though, about how the wild turkey has now expanded its range, increased its numbers to the point where turkey hunting is available in most of the United States. Now, all of this increase in turkey flocks did not come cheaply or quickly. Scientific management techniques together with trapping and transplanting wild stocks of turkeys have brought the wild turkey back. This tape is also told from the perspective of a grandfather telling this fabulous success story to his grandson. It's produced in conjunction with the United States Forest Service, the South Carolina Wildlife and Marine Resources Department, and is available by calling the National Wild Turkey Federation in Edgefield, South Carolina at 803-637-3106. Also, anyone interested in information on starting a chapter of the National Wild Turkey Federation or just interested in learning more about wild turkeys should feel free to call the National Wild Turkey Federation at the same number. Fishing piers on inland lakes have never been regarded as prime fishing territory, but for people who use wheelchairs, piers are far better than fishing from the bank. In Michigan's Livingston County, the youth group from the County Wildlife and Conservation Club built a pier accessible to physically handicapped anglers. Although it was on public land on a public lake, did the government help pay for it? Well, no, this, the, we applied for a couple of grants, but we were turned down, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So um, we went out and raised the money ourselves, and plus the donations of the local people and businesses and lumber yards and cement companies, and it's completely paid for. Mm -hmm. Judy Ashenbrenner's son Dave was the president of the youth group when this pier was built. Our own Roger McCarville found that lots of community support was behind this pier, too. How was the response when you went to the community and asked to help for the funding because you didn't get the grants? They were really helpful. I think everybody we asked donated some money or food or whatever we asked them for. Did you go all over the area or just Brighton? No, um, Pinckney, Brighton, Howell, all the surrounding communities, Chelsea. Like David said, not one person turned us down. Everyone donated something that we asked. And again, where did you get the idea for this? I think it kind of originally, like David said, we were members of Outdoors Forever, and um, they got to talking about it at a meeting one time, and um, yeah. David's grandpa is handicapped, and Dick and him started talking about it, and we just started talking about this project, and it just kind of snowballed. Senior citizens, young kids, people who don't own boats, they all can use a pier like this to get a little further from the bank to where the fishing might be a little better. Jim Munson, a student at Wright State University, fell out of a tree when he was camping as a youngster. Now he uses a wheelchair, and this pier gives him another place to fish. Do you fish a lot? Yeah, I try to get out as much as I can. My friends and I will go out, and uh, I'll just put a put a lawn chair in the back of a rowboat, and I'll transfer and just jump right in the back of the rowboat. Did you fish much? before you got in your accident? Yeah, I did. My grandma lives on a lake, my uncle lives on a lake, yeah. and I went fishing a lot. Just like to be outside, like to just walk in the yeah. woods and stuff. So you know the technique? Yeah. Huh? yeah. You don't have to go back and relearn that? No. Do you have any trouble, you know, finding places that are accessible? Yeah, you do. The, you know, there's, you can't do much shore fishing just because, you know, the area's not real accessible and you end up getting to us if you can get to the spot, you can't get out far enough where the fish are and stuff. Now, let me see this perfect cast the here. Perfect cast, eh? The All Jim right. Munson. Wright State University cast. Well, oh, what do you think of these right kids? Wow. They're great. They did a lot of work. Got we, a, lot of, a lot of donations and stuff, but they had to do the work. When you were a kid, did you think about doing this for handicappers? Not really. You know, you don't. Until you get in the situation, you don't. Yeah. It's like you don't even think about it. But you know, then you th you think you wish you would have. But yeah, that's the worst thing. We're with this outdoors forever. We hope we can kind of all get people thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. That's just it. You just don't you don't think about them wanting to get out and do right. the things that you know they did before they 
they got hurt. I think my purpose with the youth group is to get the kids motivated in a conservation project and to do something to help the community, to put ba something back to the community for all the things that we've been given. It's been a good life and these kids out here have a good life and we're just trying to teach them to, to put back what you take out. And this has been a good project for them. They're very, very proud of themselves and they have a right to be. They've worked very hard in the last year selling things to raise the money to build this pier. Judy Ashenbrenner captures the spirit we like to see outdoors, the spirit of giving and sharing. And we're proud that Outdoors Forever has opened at least a few small doors to fishing, not just to handicappers, but for everybody. People don't have to be handicapped to, to use this dock. Now that's you know, what we call it accessible. Yeah, exactly. You just, just if, they, if you're gonna build a dock, you might as well make it so everybody can use it. Mm -hmm. Charlotte Parada has sent us a recipe for catfish that's mm. just a little bit different. Good woman catfish, she right. called it, and it was a winner in our fish and wild game cooking contest last year. And you're going to just saute the green onions and the tops in butter. Now, there's mm -hmm. an excellent looking oh, catfish. Oh, look at that. You know, catfish sometimes has that yellowish fat on it, which should be trimmed off, has been trimmed off. Oh, these oh. are just oh. perfect. And then excellent. you're going to make a poaching liquid here out of just a little bit of butter, some red wine, not a white wine hmm. that you usually find in a fish recipe. Yeah, that's normal for fish. And a little bit of water just to bring the liquid up. And, and some lemon juice. Huh. Well, that's called a, a, a court bouillon or a poaching a bouillon, bouillon. Right. Yeah, when you're and poaching. You don't want to overcook it here. You just want to do it just until it starts to flake apart. Hmm. And then you do want to save the liquid once this comes out. Yeah, now you don't turn the fish over no, in you a don't. poaching bouillon. No, nope, you never do in a poaching. Huh. And well, then, boy, that looks on the brink <laughs> of falling apart. Yes, it was right there. And you do want to save this because you're going to put it back into a white sauce that we're going to make. Yeah, that's a lemon juice, wine, and butter. Right. And then you're, it's just a basic white sauce. Your butter and flour, and instead of milk, we're going to use uh, cream, which Heavy makes it just cream. a little bit richer oh, and Bob thicker. Bob Garner will love yes, it. Yes, he will. Yeah. And then you do add your poaching liquid back into it. Mm -hmm. And it just this makes a nice, light, light white light, sauce. Light, kind yes. of rich. Well, this will lighten it up. And then your green onions that you mm -hmm. sautéed. Oh, yeah. I almost forgot about that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the white pepper. White pepper, right, and, and a little bit of salt. And then you're going to put the white sauce on, and mm. this does go back in the broiler, or goes in the broiler. Mm -hmm. A little bit of Swiss cheese on top and paprika. Hmm. Excellent recipe. It seems like a lot to go through. Oh, it's worth every bit of it. I mean, catfish is, is always good fried, but, you know, those ingredients do look tasty. But, you know, Bob Garner... I don't believe is, I've never heard him talk that much about catfish. I'm not the world's biggest fan of catfish. I don't want to get you anybody know why? mad or anything. You know why? why? You just haven't had that much of it. You <laughs> that's don't, true. You haven't fished for catfish well, it's a not, lot in your life. Well, that's, that's yeah, true. but yes, that's, okay. that's right. But also when I did eat catfish, I wasn't all that enamored mm -hmm. with it. I'm a walleye and perch and bluegill man. Mm. But it has a texture all to its own. In mm. this recipe, it's just delightful. Mm. Oh, it's very good. This is the best catfish I've I ever think had. So. I think Seriously. so. Hey, I mean, the recipe's good, mm -hmm. but this catfish in particular, we're getting the hang of it. Mm -hmm. There's no question about it, and I think it's mm. because it's smaller catfish, and the smaller mm -hmm. catfish, like a lot of other species, the better it tastes. Mm. Just delicious. I know, this cheese is good with it. This catfish is good by itself. Mm -hmm. So what mm. do you think? Are you going to catch more catfish now, Bob? No, <laughs> but I'll tell you why. You'll I'll eat tell more you why. If I catch it up. When, yeah, when, when, when you catch them and Kathy catches them and cooks them up, I'd be glad to eat them. We're good. Hey, it's a public service. <laughs> if that recipe looked good to you, but you didn't catch all the ingredients, no problem. It's in the new July August issue of the. Well, from tonight's show, you probably learned that you can catch big catfish at night, and lots of them. I'm with you, though, if you think that fishing all night long is kind of a pain in the neck. It, it, it does kind of throw you. So I'll tell you what, you don't have to go fishing at night. Just please, this weekend, try to get out and fish somewhere, someplace, because the outdoors is a great place to be. See you next week. Weekly telecast of Outdoor Digest is made possible through the cooperation of this and other public television stations nationwide. Weekly production of the Outdoor Digest television show is a function of Fred Trost's Outdoors Club, promoting public understanding of hunting and fishing, appreciation of wildlife, and enjoyment of our great outdoors. Bugs on the camera light.
Woo! That's something else. Now, what else do we have? You have a crawdad rig? And I just had one for, for a nightcrawler. Nightcrawler? Where is that? We wanted some action. Uh, well, and Kate, we better we better pull all stops here, <laughs> don't you think? Yeah, why not? And this is rigged. Is, is a night crawler rigged up the same way? Yes. Just for the yeah, just a little smaller. Hope so. Now, give me the lowdown on these Grand River catfish. How are they going to hit? Well, sometimes if it's a mud cat, you may not even know it's on. You just pick it up and set there. A little tap, tap, tap. Maybe. Maybe you'll pick it up and drop back ten feet. You know, this is this is this is some of the more difficult conditions we've had, OJ, to film something. Um, um, I, it's nice that they aren't mosquitoes. Have you, have you been bitten yet, OJ? Nope. No, I haven't been bitten yet. They're crawling all over me. <laughs> I mean, literally in my mouth. Why? <laughs> Turn that camera off. Turn that thing off.